So I'd first like to say I'm absolutely honoured to have um, you on my show, which is a brand new um, podcast from Now Spinning magazine. And I couldn't be more pleased to have you, Dean, uh, as the first guest on my show. Um, my, my story with you actually began with the song Lydia. Oh, yeah. I bought that when I was a teenager in 1978. I was 19. And um, I absolutely love that song. It had the right mixture of melancholy and angst <laughs> which was like, ideal for where i was at the time and uh, i was uh, trying to, i was an aspiring guitarist back then and i don't know why but i used to find that a great song to play an extended guitar solo at the very end i just Excellent. felt it, that was that was what i heard in my head um and i felt that your your very pictorial um songwriting has been like as seem to identify with where people were in their stage in their life as as you've gone through it you're a wonderful storyteller and i guess that's really where um your new album american lullaby comes in because it's just full of stories isn't it well you know what i i love all kinds of music but i've always had an affinity for uh, the kind of songwriter you describe uh, people like Joni Mitchell and Randy Newman and, and Paul Simon, uh, folks who painted pictures with their words and music uh, and, and told stories, uh, creating these little universes, uh, sometimes in dialogue, sometimes with a narrative, but always uh, inviting the listener into the song, uh, which always impressed me as a, a, an aspiring songwriter starting out. Uh, and uh, to this day, that's my goal. Uh, I think of what I do pretty much as you characterize it, as someone who writes short stories set to music. Because on your new album, you, there's quite a few sound effects um, on, at the start or at the end of, or during the songs. And they're like little mini movies, but without, the, without the, the visuals. Is that how you kind of see them in your mind when you create them? It is. I, I, I am trying to, uh, I guess, really paint a picture almost of a cinematic quality uh, to immerse the listener into that world, to, to use a, a lot of detail, but leave a lot of detail out enough so that uh, when the listener uh, is relating to elements of the story, they can fill in those gaps with their own experience and, yeah. and, and, and thereby become a part of the story, a part of that song. And, uh, you know, that's something that, as, again, as a listener starting out, those were the songs that always uh, were compelling to me. And uh, I, I, I hope to offer the listener that same kind of experience. So on the new album, I did make an extra effort, uh, in part because I had the luxury of time because of the pandemic and the lockdown. I was able to spend more time than ever, uh, than any studio album I've ever recorded in the past. And I was able to follow through on some of those visions uh, and, and in terms of how I wanted to craft the story and the song. Uh, and in particular, how, how to introduce it, how to set the stage. And uh, so I, I, I took a, a, what, for me, were a lot of chances, but I'm gratified by the really positive response. Because it seems on paper quite a, a heavy subject. I mean, we've just gone through, as humans, probably one of the darkest periods of many of us will, will have gone through. But you've managed to weave in a lot of hope in those songs. I mean, I grew up in the 70s. Now for you, you had Vietnam, but in the UK, the only real worries we had was whether our parents would let us grow our hair long. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now- yeah, Apparently they did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got away with that. Um, but, but now there's so much, and looking at those song titles, how, did you, when you approach these subjects, were you aware of it's a fine line between being positive and, 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 and trying to help people see the hope? You know, Phil, I was very conscious uh, of, of trying to 
achieve some kind of balance. And in fact, it's why I titled the, the album in the title track, American Lullaby, uh, because my goal was really to, to chronicle all the crazy stuff that, that has happened to all of us around the world over the last six years, ever, ever since a, a, a really mentally deranged money laundering uh, con artist from New York became president of the United States. No one could believe it, not even his supporters. No one imagined that that, that was gonna happen. Uh, no one fully grasped the, the, the influence that Vladimir Putin had on, on the election or on Brexit. And my effort, my attempt on the whole album was to try and make some kind of sense, uh, or, or at least try and depict what had happened uh, in an effort to process it. Because we don't know what happened or what's still happening and what's in front of us. And we might not really have a full grasp of it for 100 years. But in the meantime, uh, it, it didn't seem right to just ignore it, to make believe that all these horrible things did not occur, because they did. And if we're gonna have any hope of facing what's happening coming up in the future, then we need to have some understanding of the past. So when I write a song, it's first to help me understand what just happened, and hopefully uh, you know, offer some measure of uh, relating or understanding or, or at least uh, some distraction or, or entertainment yeah. or, or, or solace to the listener. And so I, I approached it in terms of a lullaby because if you think about it, lullabies in every culture around the world have this very weird aspect in common, which is that they talk about horrible things that will happen to little children. You think about the simplest rock up by baby on the treetop. When the wind blows, the cradle will rock. When the bow breaks, the cradle will fall with the baby and knocking the baby on the head out of the tree. I mean, that's a horrible thing to sing to a little kid when you're trying to put them that's to sleep. Yeah. And yet it is a characteristic of all lullabies because I, 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 I take it to mean that, that there's this innate uh, yearning to impart messages uh, of warning to the next generation, but to couch them in soothing, comforting tones so you don't scare the hell out of everybody. Uh, and uh, so that was my attempt on the new album. I, I wanted to uh, deal with a lot of difficult topics, uh, but I, I, I didn't want to leave people quivering <laughs> like a mass of jelly at the end of the album. So I, I was intentional about leavening that, uh, as I normally do. It's just kind of my style. Uh, with a, a healthy dose of humor and an ample measure of silliness, because I think you know not just in, <laughs> in, in albums, but in life in general, I think that's a really critical survival mechanism, a coping mechanism, uh, 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 really the only rational way to navigate and negotiate reality is to have a sense of humor about it, because otherwise it really can be <laughs> doom and gloom. I think the the title song is is probably one of my favorite songs off the album. Um, but the, the next one that comes close to that actually is very different in its style and that's um, too much stuff. Uh, because obviously my, my now spinning um, magazine, I have a private Facebook community with hundreds of people in it. And the people are always saying, I've got all these albums and I, I don't know whether if I played them all, I've got, I'm going to be on the planet long enough to, to listen to them all. And then probably as men, uh, well, me, everyone's got a drawer with those old scart leads in or a random tungsten bulb or something. Sure. That, yeah. And I also liked on the, the the album cover where it looks like you poured a bucket of words onto the page. But how did you, <laughs> how, how did you, when you wrote that, did you have trouble fitting all the songs into the melody? It was, it's just an amazing <laughs> feat. <laughs> well, I, 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 it was a challenge, let me tell you. Um, I, I, I've read recently that, that pop songs in general have, if you analyze them over the last 40, 50 years, they have fewer and fewer lyrics. The top 10 records and the number one records, they're just less lyrics. And, and, and of those fewer lyrics, there are more repetitions than ever before. Uh, and I guess you know, they come up with an algorithm that, that, that that's how you create an earworm. Well, I took the opposite approach and <laughs> too much stuff. 
because I, I, I guess in, in, intuitively I was trying to reflect in the lyric the subject I was talking about. And in part, it's a metaphor for uh, compulsive consumerism. And, uh, and in part, how we've gotten to the mess that we're in. Uh, but it also is an innate human characteristic, uh, which is to collect. And, uh, and at some point, collect, collecting borders on hoarding. <laughs> and, yes, and obsession, it, yeah. And you're never really sure where that line is drawn, because, uh, and for, for sure, I never, I don't know where that line is drawn, because yeah, you know, I'm a multimedia artist, producer. Uh, you know, I've I've done recordings and books and virtual reality video games and built strange musical instruments. So I've got so much stuff, and uh, I can barely keep track of it. But I'm loath to to get rid of any of it because My you never know. It might be useful. She's throw throw stuff away all the time, including me. But uh, um, so uh, it, it's just a characteristic that that people share. And uh, in fact, all my friends and relatives uh, uh, were, were certain that I wrote the song about them. Uh, and, and in part, that's true, uh, because it, it is a, a shared impulse. And uh, it just naturally came out in the lyrics as I try to uh, depict and enumerate and catalog all that stuff. It's a very, very clever song, and in various places I thought, oh, that's me, yep, that's me. And I think everyone will probably listen to it and think, yeah, that's me. Um, play, are you, I mean, playing live, that's a lot of words to remember. Do you do, you do some of them mix and match if you? <laughs> I, I gotta be honest, Phil, it is my greatest fear because I have this uh, online fringe Zoom uh, uh, show that I'm doing uh, in the middle of August. Uh, the 13th, 14th, 15th, and the 20th, 21st, and 22nd of August. Uh, I'll be doing a Zoom concert, uh, and I'll be performing all the al uh, all the tracks on the album live. Wow! Uh, right here in the studio uh, that we're talking uh, via Zoom, and uh, the, my greatest terror is uh, having to learn the lyrics to that song in particular, uh, aside from all the other tracks on the album, uh, because there are so many. It is so chock full of lyrics, but I've been practicing. Yeah, and uh, I, I'll, I'll try to be prepared so I'm not too scared. <laughs> Brilliant. The the next one, halfway normal world. Um, this is a very poignant song, and I think very heartfelt. And again, everyone will identify with this. And I think that the, the the lyrics are just beautiful in in how we all realise things we took for granted were suddenly taken away from us. Um, what's what sort of things? As you say, they're all the things that make us human. But what did you feel the most that had gone, that you realized the world had changed at that point? Well, uh, along with everybody else on the planet, uh, uh, a sense of loss about not just being able to visit your family or, or friends, uh, to, you know, to meet, them up for, meet up with them for lunch or, or, or just to go visit and hang out. And, uh, you know, at first there was sort of this novelty about it, but uh, over uh, very soon it became uh, very uh, depressing and palpably so. Uh, and, uh, you know, everyone's managed uh, according to their own circumstances. I and my family were very blessed, and uh, uh, we didn't suffer any of those dire circumstances. And, uh, you know, as an artist, I, 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 I would think that what I share in common with a lot of artists is that it did force you to stop and take stock uh, uh, and, and, and gave you the luxury of time that you don't normally have when you have to navigate the real world uh, to I I explore and engage in your art. Uh, so uh, I, I missed the same things that everyone else did. Community, uh, personal contact, yeah. or even just, you know, meandering about. <laughs> uh, there, there, there was this sense uh, of anxiety about everything you did uh, yeah. when you left the threshold of your own home. And that persists to this day. That, 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 that's not gone, although there has been some opening up. There's still this yeah. undercurrent of uh, concern and fear because nobody really knows uh, what's down the road. 
Uh, and there are always these red flags and, and warning signs that uh, remind us not to, to, to take it all too for granted because it's not over yet. Uh, so in the song, I tried to really address all those feelings of, 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 of yearning for some sense of normalcy. I think you, and I think you've done an absolute wonderful job with that. And I think the other thing that I've, I've listened to the album a few times is the actual sequencing of each track. That they all, they all work as a whole story of of your vision of, of 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 the concept of the album. In fact, it almost is a concept album in some ways. But then, because that leads up into the swing of things, when we all went into lockdown and we and and obviously what you're saying, a halfway normal world. But then a lot of us, and I had a lot of friends like this, who seemed to just lose all their energy. They just couldn't get going, even though they had the look this gift of time. They were just stuck. Did you feel that? I, I certainly did. Uh, you know, even though nothing, for most people, the people that were spared the worst uh, of the pandemic, uh, even though most people suddenly had uh, the luxury of all this time uh, to indulge in uh, a variety of pursuits, there was still a very traumatic an abrupt break from their routine and their sense of norm normalcy and, and their sense of uh, security and comfort in, in terms of uh, being able to generally anticipate what was gonna happen next. Yeah, That was just blown to smithereens and, and it left people anxious and depressed. And even if nothing terrible was happening to them, that, uh, that rending of uh, the familiar world was very traumatic and uh, and takes some time to recover from and some conscious effort to do so. So when I wrote The Swing of Things, it was curiously when my whole family came down with what was, I'm sure, just a ordinary flu uh, a few weeks before the pandemic. Um, you know, for all I know, it could have been COVID, but none of us tested positive. But we all came down with the flu, and it knocked us, you know, for a loop, and it took everybody a while to, to get back their energy and enthusiasm for uh, n navigating the world. And as it was happening to me, I was very conscious of that. And uh, I wrote the song really almost, well, for myself, First, to remind myself that I have to engage with the world and just you know get up my off my ass and 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 walk out the door, get things done, uh, but also to, to uh, sort of reassuring my kids because I know they had a tough time as well. I wanted to, to remind them that look, you, you probably feel really lousy and you, you don't want to do anything. You want to lay in bed and just forget the world, but uh, slowly but surely, uh, if you get up and uh, shake it off, uh, things will look brighter. You'll be okay. It's all going to be oh, it's all going to work out fine, and eventually, you'll you'll slowly get back into the swing of things. And that was the genuine sentiment, and that's what I tried to put in the song. Well, again, it works really well, and uh, and, you, and it's very mo very motivational and inspiring. But at the same time, it takes a serious message. But you've put a lot of hope into that, and which then leads us into the next one, which is another like serious song which is sorry about that <laughs> which is again for, for young people the, the world that they're inheriting and the climate i mean when i was growing up greenpeace were talking about saving the whale uh, but but now it's saving the planet it's and the, the, the fires are we all under the floods and it, it's a it's a big thing and it's a scary place and, and this is again your spin on this is very different how did you how did this song come about? Well, it's just, you know, opening my eyes, reading the headlines. You know, for such a long time, everyone has been talking about the, the pending climate disaster, the looming climate uh, catastrophe. Well, it's no longer pending. It is no longer looming. It's here, as you just said. You know, the west coast of America is on fire. Parts of Europe are underwater. And uh, we've had plenty of advanced warning. We, we, you know, our ostensible leaders 
uh, for some, you know, genuinely uh, earnest efforts have really not addressed the problem. Uh, it's only getting worse, and there is a limited time frame, if at all, for us to to mitigate uh, the the worst effects of it all. And uh, I wrote the song really out of a sense of extreme guilt, uh, recognizing that here we are, we were blessed with this beautiful, uh, awesome, miraculous planet, and uh, we're bequeathing it to a new generation, and we've left it a mess. And they're gonna be the ones to have to, to live in it and to clean it up if it's possible at all to do so. Uh, yeah. If not, they're going to all have to try and uh, get tickets to Elon Musk's, <laughs> you know, flight to to Mars to survive on another planet, uh, if that's even possible in their lifetimes. So I wrote it as, as an apology to the next generation, to my own kids. Uh, you know, my uh, son and daughter uh, uh, were living together on the West Coast in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. They both flew east when all the wildfires uh, caused yeah. uh, ridiculous air pollution all over California and uh, Oregon and uh, Washington. And uh, my son never went back. Uh, he's still <laughs> living with us. But because the air quality was so bad, wow. uh, because of climate change, because of something that was predictable. Uh, so, again, I, I wrote the song, apologizing to my kids and to everybody's kids for the mess we've left them. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the and then I was listening to an, a, a track from um, 12, 12 songs, the Ducks of St. Stephen's Green, and that's a serious subject. But again, done in your kind of trademark, light-hearted, a bit like I was. What made me go and listen to that song was listening to the Russians are coming, welcome to stupid town, and wear a mask, etc. They all seem part of that family of where you 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 approach a serious subject but you make it, again, this fine line between, you know, being serious and, and lighthearted. Do you have fun doing those? They, they sound like you had real fun writing them and recording them. Well, I, I enjoy the results. <laughs> <laughs> Actually writing them can, can be a challenge because uh, I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to strike a delicate balance and uh, recording them can be very gratifying and satisfying, but it also is, you know, edge of, edge of your seat, trying to, to steer it in the right direction. Yeah, because we, we, we live in an age of outrage, don't we? It only needs what, someone takes something the wrong way and then Twitter explodes. So exactly. It's, it's, so it's not an easy path, is it, um, to, to take with these, but. Well, I, 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 I didn't mind defending uh, vast amounts of people, uh, but, but if I were going to do that, I, I just wanted to do it uh, in, in, in at least a sincere, authentic, and uh, factual way, and where appropriate with a sense of humor. And uh, that's certainly the case in something like The Russians Are Coming. Yeah, because that was, as you say in your sleeve notes, it was actually factual all the way through, wasn't it? So it's, a, you know, it's a, Oh, yeah, 100%, yeah. every word of it based on uh, the Intelligence Committee's uh, report on uh, Russian interference in the 2016 ele ele election. Everything based on hardcore documented yeah. facts about uh, how, indeed, uh, the... Trump campaign colluded with uh, the Russian intelligence agencies to throw the American election. And the only reason he's not in jail is because uh, two of his leading co-conspirators uh, were indicted, jailed, and kept their mouths shut uh, because they knew Trump was going to pardon them. And indeed, that's what happened. He did, and he's still out of jail. Yeah. Uh, well, over, here, over this side of the Atlantic, we're just as surprised as you are. Uh, well, <laughs> you, I know you got your own issues there. Yeah, we've got uh, our own issues. I know uh, this, <laughs> someone funded uh, Nigel Farage and his cohorts yeah. to throw the Brexit election. Uh, and it was all uh, Putin needed to do to throw the Western democracies into disarray, yeah. uh, to, to throw a uh, wrench into the, the gears. And uh, really, it, it's 
it, it, it's people don't like to talk about it. They don't like to admit it. It's like you know acknowledging that Kim Philby was <laughs> a high intelligence officer for years and years working for the Russians. Well, it happened, uh, and it happened again. So uh, you know you, you you can ignore it or you can acknowledge it and then move on trying to make things yeah. a little better next time. And then the album, then to me, the, the, the album takes a, a slightly different turn with um, I Wish You Joy, which I, I love this song. It's got a very 70s vibe to it. It sounds like some of your earlier albums. Was that intentional? Were you aware of you were getting like a 70s kind of sound with the strings and the, uh, the instrumentation? Well, in terms of the genre and idiom, that wasn't intentional. I guess it's just where I come from. Yeah, uh, you know all my music. Uh, look, I, my records have always been very eclectic, uh, and anyone that's, that's familiar with my music beyond just the top forty radio hits knows that that on the Dean Friedman album you're going to hear jazz, rock, pop, country, folk, bluegrass, really you name it, whatever serves the song, whatever serves the story I'm trying to tell, and uh, so that being said, my roots are. Uh, in uh, you know, a certain kind of uh, harmonic vocabulary that comes from my jazz training. Uh, and in terms of pop music, the, the closest idiom that utilizes that kind of jazz harmony would be R&B. Mm -hmm. uh, and those R&B ballads that have this luscious harmony and chord progressions that uh, are very steeped in the jazz universe. Uh, well, even my pop songs like Lucky Stars um, uh, employ those kinds of grooves and harmonies, even though it's not readily apparent. So in a song like I Wish You Joy, uh, I guess I, that's where I went, uh, to, to, to express that desire. And similar to uh, slowly getting back into the swing of things, there was no escaping the fact that all of these events uh, you know, Trumpism, racism, sexism, climate uh, disaster. Uh, you, you could just, you know, go yeah. on and on. All, all of this cataclysmic uh, events that, that were barraging our consciousness day after day were uh, creating a, a mass depression uh, globally. <laughs> it was palpable. You couldn't escape it. And it wasn't being spoken of a lot. It wasn't being acknowledged or talked about a lot. And yet it's crucial to our daily existence and our emotional health. And I was feeling it, and so I wanted to express it sort of to remind myself and you know, offer it up to anyone else who might be open to that idea, which is that, uh, yeah, you know, sometimes things look really, really bleak <laughs> and, and awful, and maybe they are, and maybe there's nothing we can do about it, but even so, uh, in, in the midst of that, the, those worst down, turns uh, I, I, I wish you joy because if you open your eyes there's still beauty and wonder in the world and uh, sometimes you have to consciously seek it out uh, to balance all the reality that you're grappling with day to day and, I, that's, and, and that's, that's the basis of the song and that's the power of music isn't it because you could say there's never been a better time to be a protest singer <laughs> than now because you've got so much subject material but in a way, you also want music to be the healer and to help and to bring people together and create stronger and more positive communities. And uh, I think that the, the two songs to me that bookend your album, are obviously the, the, the first and last track uh, on, on a summer's night is, I think is a beautiful song. And I might pronounce this wrong, but is it a, a flugelhorn that the, at the start? Indeed, it, it is a flugelhorn. And it's the way you've mixed it in, it's like as if it's on a summer's evening and it's kind of like playing in the, as the sun goes down. This is what I see in my head. Um, but it reminds me of the song, uh, Where Have All the Angels Flown from Songs for Grown Ups. Where oh, that's it's interesting. A, it's got a same, because I, I could be wrong, but it's like a flugelhorn in that track and it, it's got a similar vibe. And I just love that. I just love that sound. Well, thank you. I'm pleased to hear that. It was a, a, a conscious attempt to try and sum up the album 
but uh, with, with a general reminder that, you know, as I say, trying to achieve that balance between dire warnings yes. and hope, which is uh, to say, look, we've been through a really bad experience. There's still trouble ahead. And yet, at this moment in time, I'm sitting here next to you, the sun's going down, the crickets are chirping, birds are tweeting, the owls are owl hooting in the, in the, in the distance. Yeah, that's what I could see, yeah. And so at the moment, you know, the, the village below us is calm and, uh, and the world seems right. And, and so I, I wanted to offer up after, you know, banging people on the head with all this crazy stuff that's going on, I really wanted to, to, to leave them with a sense of hope uh, and possibility. And uh, the idea that even in the midst of troubled times, that it's incumbent on all of us to find a peaceful place, to find the beauty in the world, to acknowledge it, to embrace it, and to enjoy it. And uh, I, I, uh, I, in particular, chose that instrument that you mentioned, the flugelhorn. Uh, a local musician, Marvin Stam, played a beautiful part. And uh, I, I chose that instrument because it, it, a unique characteristic of the flugelhorn, as opposed to other horns, like the trumpet or the trombone, yeah. is that it has this beautiful quality to it of, of sweetness, and yet there's a, a, a haunting, poignant edge to it. Uh, and that really spoke to me as the voice for what I was saying in the song, because even though the chorus says, you know, uh, all is calm and the world seems right, I, I, I don't say that the world is right. I don't say the world is going to be right. I say it seems right which for our purposes yeah. <laughs> at the moment, while we're enjoying this song and, and this, uh, the moonlight uh, after the sunset uh, and, and the backyard and the, and the world beyond, is that for this moment, things seem okay. Yeah, that's, uh, what, I, that's, that's what I like about you, because you say it's a positive, it's a positive song, but I think the, the flugelhorn gives a sense of melancholy that it's, there's an unease it, it works really well. The music speaks without the words being said at that point, I think. Well, I'm pleased to hear that. And again, that's the reality of the song because you can't acknowledge that we haven't been through a difficult... You can't not acknowledge that we have the, no. the, 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 the difficult time we've been through. Um, but you can't remain uh, immersed and and wallow in that yeah. depression and angst you really do need to to move forward and and hope have hope and try yeah. to make a better wor world uh, it's incumbent upon us yes uh, 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 the nature of our humanity is to have some kind of hope and faith uh to, to be able to move forward that's why a, a silly song like just another birthday song uh, which is also towards the end, end of the album. Uh, it's, to my mind, it, it's just another reminder, which is that even when things are bad, it, is that it, it's, it's, it is incumbent upon us to open our eyes to the wonders that exist and to celebrate uh, the joy that is possible, uh, even if you don't feel like it. <laughs> because uh, it, to ignore it, it is to only live half your life. Yeah. yeah. And uh, looking at the song, uh, sorry, the credits for the actual recording, it looks like it's a bit of a family affair. Um, you've got quite a few family members on the playing with you. Uh, yes, my, uh, my daughter Hannah, my son Sam, uh, even our little dog Lola has a cameo <laughs> in one of those tracks. Um, you know, uh, this album was done over a period of eight months during the right in the thick of the lockdown. Uh, and, uh, you know, the bulk of it was me uh, performing here in the studio you're, you're looking at right now um, and doing all the keyboards and guitar and, and, uh, and vocals and whatnot. 
But I did have uh, uh, the wonderful assistance of a, a, a whole bunch of really talented musicians who sent in their parts remotely. Wow. Uh, my son Sam is living upstairs, so he actually just stepped, came downstairs and played <laughs> brilliant keyboard parts and harmonica parts all over the album. So uh, that was great. He was here live in studio. Uh, my daughter Hannah uh, provided a, a beautiful background vocals for I Wish You Joy. Um, uh, and there were uh, many other uh, remote contributions. Uh, folks like uh, Katie Rose Bennett and Zolene Mayberry and uh, Charlotte Campbell and uh, Ke Kevin Fox, uh, who uh, is a great uh, musician from Canada. He, he tours with Stephen Page from Bare Naked Ladies. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin Fox uh, uh, sent in uh, the beautiful solo uh, cello parts that uh, are all over the title track, American Lullaby. Uh, and I, I mentioned Marvin Stamm, who played the flugelhorn on the last track uh, on a summer's night. So I, I didn't do it alone. I, I had uh, the, the assistance of a, a whole bunch of really uh, talented musicians uh, who, you know, in their own home studios, yeah. laid down their parts, sent them in. I, pieced everything together, and uh, lo and behold, it turned into an album. And do you, and talking of records, do you, do you collect music yourself? Are you, a, are you someone who buys albums yourself from artists you grew up with, like you mentioned Joni Mitchell, or do you still, without saying going back to too much stuff, but do you still buy records yourself? You know, I admit I'm a victim of streaming. Oh. Uh, because it's so accessible. Uh, and on occasion, I will order a CD and pop it in my car. Uh, the truth is, is that when I'm actually recording, I don't really listen to a lot of music. It's when I'm not recording or when I'm on the road touring, uh, where I'll I'll, I'll 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 hear m music, and uh, mostly I'm a, a huge fan of my songwriting uh, friends and peers uh, here and in the UK. Uh, folks like Boothby Graffo or Latch or Katie Rose Bennett or Charlotte Campbell or Tracy Curtis. Uh, all these really brilliant singer-songwriters uh, that uh, some of whom are, are not necessarily, you know, going to be played on radio too, but should be. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I enjoy listening t to my contemporaries and peers as well as, look, music from uh, from every time and place. I just love music. I, I, I don't know, it was Count Basie or Duke Ellington who said there's only, or maybe it was uh, Louis Armstrong, who knows. One of these cats uh, made a comment that, that there's only two kinds of music. There's good music and there's bad music. Yeah. I know you so, mentioned... You mentioned Joni Mitchell at the start of the interview, and I know you mentioned Joni Mitchell when you were on the Johnny Walker show on on Sunday. What would be your go-to Joni Mitchell album? Well, it's a cliche at this point because everyone's acknowledging its 50th anniversary, but Blue. Blue. Uh, I mean, I love all her albums, uh, but there was something just different and unique and uh, refreshing about the sounds and the the narrative of, of those songs. And uh, oddly enough, I was at a friend's house. Uh, her brother was washing his car, and there was a set of speakers out in the window over the driveway. And so there, he, he was blasting the album Blue. That's the first time I heard it was uh, while washing a car in the suburbs. But even in that strange environment, it was so striking once you know these dulcimer yeah. parts started playing and, and, and those very sparse instrumentations rang out and really cut through the air uh, along with her sublime voice and her just, you know, the sheer poetry of her lyrics yeah. uh, have always grabbed me. And uh, I, I'm, I'm definitely one of my biggest influences. Well, going back to your uh, wonderful new album that's about to appear, which I think is on August the 27th. Is Comes that out August 27th? It can be pre-ordered now on my website, deanfriedman.com, as well as uh, all my CDs and 
tickets to my virtual gigs. And, and are you uh, the virtual gigs? I've just got, I've got just finally a um, couple of questions about that because obviously for some artists, the the idea of Zoom and virtual gigs is kind of like it's it's something that's like a sticking plaster away but it's not the real thing but i noticed that you've said a couple of times and in in them um, a press release that you actually find doing the zoom concerts quite intimate because you get to see the audience's room and their cats and stuff like that behind them i approached it with the same skepticism and trepidation that a lot of musicians uh, in my circumstance did uh, i had to cancel a 40 city uk tour and then had to figure out what to do uh, so I, I bought a, a camera and uh, taught myself some of these web streaming uh, tools. And uh, over time, I, I quickly grew to appreciate some of the unique characteristics of Zoom. And, and again, I look forward to being in a real live venue with real live people. Uh, nothing will ever replace that. But in the interim, and to supplement that, uh, as you say, there is some weird intimacy about a Zoom event because if you think about it, when I'm in a, 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 a live venue, even a small venue, I can usually only see the faces of the people in the first few rows. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, it's kind of a blur. Um, and uh, by comparison on a Zoom concert, I can see pages and pages of people in the gallery Wow. Up close and personal, I, I can see right in their homes, I can see their pets jumping up on their laps, I can see their family wandering in and out wondering what the hell's going on, I can see what they're snacking on, uh, and what's more, they can not only see me, again, if you think about a, a, a regular typical live show, that if, if you're sitting in the audience, you see the performer, in that case me, on stage, and you see the back of people's heads in front That's of you. Right. That's right. That's it. That's all you see. Whereas in a Zoom concert, you see me and you see everybody else. <laughs> Not only that, you get to chat with everybody else uh, without interrupting my song. <laughs> uh, and it really does uh, foster this unusual sense of community, uh, which I think is unique to that Zoom environment. Everyone still wants to be able to be in a real space and, and have a, a close personal connection. But I would propose that uh, there's something unique about that virtual space, uh, which is worth considering and uh, for which I'm grateful and appreciative of. Okay, so when are you basically doing a Zoom tour? So when are the dates that people can get their virtual ticket? <clears throat> August 13, 14, and 15. And then the next weekend again, August 20th, 21st, and 22nd. Uh, it'll be a virtual Zoom concert, part of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. This would have been my 18th Fringe Festival if I had been able to get in and out of the country uh, uh, without any trouble or quarantine. They only just today announced that, that uh, Americans that are vaccinated can come in without a quarantine. But I, I did know that uh, you know, when I had to schedule all this. And even so, it still would have been a precarious choice to make. Uh, but in any case, you can get tickets to uh, the Zoom concerts. It's, I'll be premiering uh, the album live. Uh, it'll be a 90-minute Zoom show. Uh, you'll be in the audience, and you can see everybody else in the audience and uh, interact. And you can get tickets through my website or through the edfringe.com website. Uh, and it's, uh, it's always a blast. It's always a, a really fun time. And uh, I, uh, I promise by then I'll learn most of the lyrics <laughs> to all my new songs uh, and, and how to play them. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's, 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 it's going to be a blast. It'll and, be a lot of fun. And will and, people be able to hear, will you be playing Lucky Stars and Lydia as well? I'll also, absolutely, I'll be throwing in uh, a, a bunch of familiar uh, favorites like Lucky Stars and uh, Ariel and Lydia and... Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I won't send folks home w w without those songs. And also to say that uh, uh, separate to the Zoom concert I'm doing for the Fringe Festival, I'll continue to do a monthly uh, all request Zoom concert the last Sunday of every month. And come April of next year, April 2022, I will be back on the road in the UK and Ireland uh, touring all over uh, the country. Uh, and a venue near you, and, and you can get tickets to Fantastic. those gigs right now on my website in the gig section of deanfriedman.com.
Fantastic. Well, thanks very much, Dean, and thanks very much for taking the time to to join me on this on this podcast. Um, and as I say, I'm really enjoying the album, and I should look forward to getting a real copy on August the 27th as well. So thank you so much, Phil. I really appreciate it, and uh, I, I wish you all the best with your new podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye bye. Take care, bye-bye. man. I look forward bye-bye. to getting a link. Will do. Thank you.